Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Beasley Allen webinar, Camp Lejeune Claims Time is Ticking. I'm David Byrne, and it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers for this important litigation topic. Today, Beasley Allen attorneys Julia Merritt and Leslie Lamacchia will update you on the deadlines that are applicable to Camp Lejeune administrative claims. They're also going to provide an overview of the relevant law, and they'll give you the most up-to-date information for screening, processing, and filing your claims. So now while we're waiting on the last of our registrants to join us, let me take just a few moments to formally introduce Julia and Leslie. My friend and partner, Julia Merritt, is a leader in Beasley Allen's Toxic Tort section, and she practices in our Atlanta office. Julia has an extensive background in toxic injury cases, and in addition to her work on Camp Lejeune claims, Julia currently serves on the Plaintiff's Executive Committee for NRA Paraquat, the national multi-district litigation regarding the herbicide Paraquat. Julia also handles talc injury cases filed under the Asbestos Act throughout Georgia. In addition to being licensed to practice in Georgia, Julia is also licensed in North Carolina. And most recently, Julia was invited to give an extensive CLE presentation on Camp Lejeune claims at the AAJ July conference. Julia is a huge asset to Beasley Allen, and we're delighted to have her here with us today. Leslie Amakia is also a key member of Beasley Allen's Toxic Tort team. Leslie handles Camp Lejeune related claims and Paraquat cases for our firm, and she served on multiple leadership committees for various mass tort litigations, including the Plaintiff's Executive Committee and Science Committee and MDL 2767 in Ray Morena the Plaintiff's Executive Committee and Co-Liaison Council roles between the Jewel MDL and the Jewel JCCP, and she continues to serve on the Plaintiff's Executive, Executive Committee in NRA Paraquat liability litigation. In addition to all of Leslie's legal achievements, she was a two-sport Division I athlete in college, playing both basketball and competing in track and field, and in her spare time as a lawyer, She's also been a professional triathlete from 2011 to 2018. We're absolutely thrilled to have Leslie on our Beasley Allen team now, and we so look forward to hearing her talk today. Now, before I turn the program over to our speakers, and while we're waiting on a few more registrants to join, I do need to go over a few CLA housekeeping notes. First, today's webinar has been approved by the Alabama and Georgia State Bars for one hour of CLE credit. In order to receive full credit for attending, you've got to stay on for the duration of today's program. A link to today's presentation was included in the Zoom confirmation email that you should have received when you registered, but by the end of this week, you're gonna receive another email with a certificate of attendance and an updated presentation and video link. You can email your completed evaluation form to webinars at beasleyallen.com. Just a reminder that today's webinar is being recorded. For those Alabama and Georgia attorneys participating by phone, please email us your name, phone number, and state bar ID number. You can send that to webinars at beasleyallen.com. That'll help us ensure that you receive full CLE credit for today's program. And for those of you practicing in other states besides Alabama and Georgia, we'll send you a certificate of attendance that you can present to your own state bar. Last but not least, be sure, check out our events page uh, at BeasleyAllen.com events as we'll be adding more webinars throughout 2023. And very important, if you have questions during today's webinar, I wanna encourage you to use the question and answer feature located at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna set aside time at the end of today's program to try and tackle all the questions submitted by our viewers. So with that, Julia, Leslie, let's get started. Hi, I just wanted to thank David for that nice introduction. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you all for attending uh, here on the East Coast. You're spending our, your lunch hour with us, and I really appreciate that. And it's a real honor and a privilege to be able to work together with like-minded individuals like you. And we're all trying to do the best that we can for these vets and civilians who were exposed to toxic water. We aren't going to talk a lot about the history of the PACT Act today. I'm not going to you know, give you an extensive preview of maps and contamination sites 
and residential history like we've done in the past. I would ask you to go back and look at our previous webinars that we have done in the past on those. They are recorded and they are available. You can email us or look on our website for that information. Um, but today, what we really want to do is talk about the updates in the administrative claims process and also in the lawsuit process. As you know, it's a two-step process in the Camp Lejeune Justice Act. The first step is to file an administrative claim with the Department of the Navy through the JAG division. And the second step is to file a lawsuit in federal court. So I, today, am going to be talking about the administrative claim process, and then I will pass it over to Leslie, and she will talk about the updates in the uh, federal court system. So previously, when a vet, a vet was exposed to contaminants, they would have to prove that the toxic exposure caused their illness. And generally, that causation failed for a lot of different reasons, because these vets didn't hire experts, couldn't afford experts, didn't have epidemiologists, didn't have the evidence, didn't have water testing, all of the things that are required to be able to prove a toxic exposure case. They would just be able to say, hey, you know, I, I drank some water and now I have cancer and that just wasn't enough for VA benefits or for a federal lawsuit. So um, generally, toxic exposure cases for veterans were denied. And that's why the PACT Act was created. And the Camp Lejeune Justice Act specifically deals with Camp Lejeune. It creates a presumption that exposure to certain toxins causes certain illnesses. So we don't, we can take away that um, the, the burden on the vet to have to prove causation. So this allows for VA benefits. And what we're talking about today is not VA benefits. We're talking about the um, federal lawsuits for the Camp Lejeune Justice Act. So as I said, there's a two-step process. The first step is filing an administrative claim. And there is a blanket deadline for all administrative claims to be filed by August 10th, 2024. Um, as you know, um, we are halfway through. So I'm sweating it. You're probably sweating it if you're watching this. And um, we have one year to file the rest of our administrative claims. It is a drop dead deadline. The second step is filing a lawsuit in federal court. Again, there is a blanket statute of limitations for all federal lawsuits, and that is six months after the administrative claim process closes. So February 10th, 2025 is the drop dead statute of limitation and statute of repose deadline for filing a lawsuit in the Camp Lejeune Justice Act. Now, the PACT Act allowed us to do this. That is the only reason we can file these claims. And so the PACT Act supersedes any statutes of limitations or statutes of repose from North Carolina, which were very draconian. They were, um, they were really tough and that's why we couldn't bring claims before the PACT Act came along. So as I mentioned, the PACT Act is the whole reason that we can bring these claims. And it is strictly construed, just like any statute. So um, the PACT Act has two main requirements on its face in order to bring a claim. The first is you have to have been at Camp Lejeune for 30 days or more between August 1st, 1953 and December 31st, 1987. And the second requirement on the face of the PACT Act is that you have to have an injury that accrued by the date the act was passed, which was August 10th, 2022. So I'm going to dig in. I just want to give you a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about how we at Beasley Allen are handling our claims, how uh, you know, kind of the overview. And then I'm going to, at the end of this, give you an update on what we have heard from JAG on these. And so I'm going to, it's kind of going to be a compare and contrast. How have we handled this this far and what is happening in reality? So there are four types of claims that are foreseeably possible for the Camp Lejeune Justice Act. The first is personal injury. And um, as I mentioned, the face of the act states that injuries must have accrued by August 10th, 2022. So we are not filing um, or 
accepting medical monitoring cases. We are only accepting cases where there has been a diagnosed injury by that date. And if you think about it, it really makes sense because the injuries started accruing back in 1953 and the end of the exposure was 1987. So if someone hasn't accrued an injury by 2022, it's pretty unlikely that they're going to accrue additional injuries and there has to be a cutoff date. So that is the cutoff date that we are operating under. The second type of claim that you can bring is a wrongful death claim. Um, so wrongful death claims are pretty tricky right now under the Camp Lejeune Justice Act. I will tell you that we at Beasley Island have not filed a wrongful death claim under um, the administrative claim process yet. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, about a quarter of all of our claimants, and I've heard this um, nationally when talking to uh, um, other law firms, you know, going to AAJ, a quarter of most claimants are deceased. So it is our practice that we are requiring our claimants to open an estate before filing the administrative claim. Now I will tell you, um, and Leslie is gonna dive into this a lot deeper, but leadership has been appointed in the litigation side in step two. So um, there, we need some clarity from the courts and from leadership on how exactly we are going to proceed with these wrongful death claims. Are we going to need the typical estate opened? Is there gonna be some sort of a shortcut? Do we need an ancillary estate opened in North Carolina? So that's why we're just holding off and we wanna do it the right way the first time. I will tell you, I believe it is the best practice to open an estate before filing an administrative claim for a lot of reasons. One of them is if you look at the actual claim form itself, section 11, and I'm gonna read this to you. It says, this, so this is specifically on the claim form for a death claim. It says an authorized agent must provide evidence establishing express authority to act for a claimant, showing title and legal capacity of the person signing with evidence of authority to present a claim. Please attach the document with your claim form. Now in emails from JAG, we have got also gotten the direction, um, do not send any records with your claim form. But I think wrongful death claims are special because we need to know who the proper party is. You have to have standing to bring a wrongful death claim, uh, whether it's a claim in the administrative capacity or in the lawsuit. So um, that's the first reason. Second reason is if, if the claim is settled, you get paid more quickly. If you know who specifically can receive the money and who gets the check written out to. Um, secondly, if or thirdly, if you um, file a lawsuit, again, you have to have proper standing to be able to file a federal lawsuit. And finally, because these wrongful death claims are so all over the place with the years of death, I mean, we can file a wrongful death claim for someone who died in 1953. Think of the estate issues we're going to have to figure out. Who is the proper representative? There are, we have a lot of claimants with siblings coming out of the woodwork. We have estranged family members. We have two different people saying that they are the only child. So we want to work this out on the front end and bring the claim on, the, on behalf of the proper person. And we also don't want multiple claims to be filed for the same decedent. Uh, one brother filed one claim, a sister filed a different claim. There is only one claim permitted per person. So um, it's best to figure this out on the front end. And the, it, this is a great opportunity to tell you to work with other counsel. If there is dual reps, this is not the situation to file first. You do not want to do that. And I'm going to tell you why a little bit later. So the third type of claim is the survival action. And um, I know we're all attorneys on this, but I'm just going to give a quick um, recap of the difference between a wrongful death and a survival action. It's um, a wrongful death is the person's death was caused by the toxic chemicals at Camp Lejeune. A survival action means that someone um, suffered maybe from, I'll give Parkinson's disease as an example, but then died from an extraneous way, for example, a car wreck. So we can't blame the car wreck on um, the toxic exposure, um, that is a survival action. The reason I have a question mark there is North Carolina has some wonky rules on this. And yet again, this is why we are waiting 
for um, court intervention and some court guidance on how to file these survival actions. So again, we have not filed any survival actions at this time. Now, loss of consortium. Um, again, you'll see a question mark at the end of this. So um, I, I don't know the answer to this, but I'm telling you what I personally believe. The act states that you have to have been at Camp Lejeune for 30 days or more to file a claim. And a loss of consortium claim is going to be the claim of a spouse who has been with the person who has suffered um, and who was at Camp Lejeune. So I don't know if we're going to be able to file um, loss of consortium claims. I have not filed a loss, loss of consortium claim yet. I've talked to other attorneys across the country who strongly believe that we're going to be able to file loss of consortium claims. And I truly hope that we are to help these people because, you know, living with a spouse who has cancer or neurological disorders or um, a variety of different conditions is, is really challenging and they deserve compensation too. I just don't know if the federal courts or the or JAG is going to actually pay out on those. So we shall see. All right. So now we're going to talk about the ATSDR and presumptive versus non-presumptive conditions. This is a lot of different buzzwords that you're going to hear in, in this um, litigation. So what is the ATSDR? It is the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. And why is it important in this litigation? Well, it assesses the presence of health hazards for specific Superfund sites like Camp Lejeune. And it created a report on Camp Lejeune. It does not do its own research, but it compiles epi studies from other different epi epidemiological reports. And it created its own report. It reviewed existing scientific literature on the contaminants and the health effects of these chemicals. So it, this report summarized 16 diseases where there is at least some casual, I'm sorry, causal connection with volatile organic compounds that contaminated the drinking water at Camp Lejeune. So those conditions that, so the, um, it, there's also a, a different standard of proof in this case. So the typical standard of proof for all of the civil litigators out there is preponderance of the evidence. Um, we all know, you know, the, the football field reference. So, you know, um, if you're going to do a criminal case, you've got to get, um, you know, all the way to the end. If you do a, a civil case, you only have to get to the 51 yard line just a little bit more. Well, for equipoise, that's different. It basically means that there is an assumption that there is not a better reason present. It is as likely as not. So this is a reduced burden of proof in the Camp Lejeune Justice Act. So why does that matter for the ATSDR report? What the ATSDR report does is it reviews these 16 injuries and determines whether there is sufficient causation or equipoise causation for certain chemicals and certain injuries. So those that have equipoise or higher in the ATSDR report are considered presumptive conditions. Those are our tier one conditions. And that is important because as you know, in a toxic exposure case, you have to prove both general and specific causation. So general causation is the could it. Could a toxin have caused this specific injury? Could benzene have caused skin cancer? That's the general causation that the ATSDR is looking at. And then we have to deal with, we the attorneys have to deal with the specific causation. That is, did our client have 30 days of exposure or more during the years when benzene was you know, at, at a higher level? Um, what type of skin cancer were they diagnosed with? Is there enough evidence to show that specific causation? So um, this equipoise allows us, if there is equipoise or higher, it allows us not to have to prove general causation in these cases. So what about all the other injuries? What about all the non-ATSDR injuries that are not equipoise or higher? Um, 
I will tell you, we at Beasley Allen have a very extensive um, inventory of our cases. We are accepting most cancers, neurological um, disorders, most autoimmune diseases, miscarriages, infertility issues, um, because we are dealing, um, we have a consulting epidemiologist who is helping us determine this general causation issue. Could X chemical have caused Y injury? And what about a myriad of five chemicals that all joined together? Could that have caused an autoimmune disease? Absolutely. So that just means we have to prove it. We're not relying only on the ATSDR to, to prove this. We're going to prove it ourselves. So, um, you know, don't just, it is our position, don't just rely on the ATSDR injuries. Um, I think that there's a lot more that, that's available to us here. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about vetting. So um, the first thing is, as this slide shows you, there are some penalties and consequences if you do not properly vet your claim. I encourage you to look at these two statutes um, and, and, you know, just read them, criminal and civil penalties. Um, so how are we vetting our claims? Uh, I will tell you that we're using the trust but verify method. That means a lot of this comes from our clients' memories. Um, you know, get their legal name, um, find out the dates that they believe that they were at Camp Lejeune, uh, find out the injuries that they believe that they have. But remember, these people are, are elderly and they are ailing because of this toxic exposure and because it's taken so long for this act to get passed. You know, a lot of our clients are in their 70s and 80s. So um, we are ordering the DD-214. The DD-214 is a, a really nice document that shows uh, where a person was stationed, uh, from what years. It's not perfect, but it is a great start. We are also requiring a diagnosis confirmation from a medical facility. Um, and, you know, it, again, it's just the trust and verify. We are requiring our document, our clients to sign a couple of documents obviously the fee contract, med auths, military auths, a signed claim form. We are mailing our clients a claim form that is blank and they are filling it out and they are signing it and they are sending it back to us. And then we are requiring our clients to sign what we are calling is a document that we created is called an authority to file an administrative claim and or open an estate. So I want a signed document from my client saying yes, I am giving you permission to file this on my behalf. Next slide. Why am I being so cautious? Well, I'm gonna read this to you verbatim because I think it's pretty important. I have to sign as the attorney representing these clients that I certify as the attorney representing the claimants below that all supporting original forms and authorizations to file claims with original signatures have been verified and are accounted for and can be provided to the Department of Navy on demand. So it's pretty important. Um, and just remember, you know, a couple slides back that, uh, that vetting uh, slide that showed the potential criminal and civil penalties. So, you know, we just want to be really careful that we have the proper documentation for these files, even though it's, I know it's a lot of volume, but we need to do it and, and do it right. So this is the um, elusive perfection letter. Um, I'm going to show you the process that we are all supposed to go through, the process that Beasley Allen has kind of created and the process that the um, JAG and the Department of Navy has created. And that process is to submit, a, you know, vet your claim, submit your claim, receive a perfection letter. And this is an example of one that I have received. And it just says, it gives you a claim number and it tells you, you have presented a claim. That's about it, okay? Um, I will tell you, we have submitted thousands of claims and I have received 22 perfection letters. That is a question I've gotten a lot of, um, you know, gosh, I, I submitted claims back in September, October, January, and I haven't gotten perfection letters, me either. So, um, 
you know, stay, stick, stick in there. We're waiting, um, you know, and, and I'm going to give you that update about that later. But I just wanted to show you an example of what this perfection letter would look like if you were to receive one. This is it. Okay, the next letter that you could receive um, is a substantiation letter. I have not received any substantiation requests yet, um, but this goes along with the process of what the um, Department of the Navy is supposed to be doing, which is once they receive some claims, they send out a perfection letter, and then they ask you for the substantiation. They say, please don't send us any documents with the claim form that we just can't handle it. When we're ready, we will ask you for it. So that is that step. As I said, we have not gone through this yet. Um, the next just kind of housekeeping um, thing I wanted to go over with you is the withdrawing and amending of claims. So withdrawal, if your client wants to withdraw for any reason, um, that you need a signed letter from the client authorizing withdrawal and you need to submit that to the Department of the Navy. So just be aware of that. And then amendments. So um, let's say I'm gonna give you an example of a client who contacts you and says, you know, I was at Camp Lejeune for 30 days and I have Parkinson's disease. Um, and then you um, get their Parkinson's disease records, you submit a claim, and then they tell you, oh, well, I also have uh, kidney disease. I forgot to tell you. So you need to submit an amendment. Um, you can feel free. It's, it's kind of a complicated process. You can feel free to email me about it if you want to, um, but you need to have your original matter ID. You need to submit it, um, show the date that it was originally submitted, what you originally submitted, and then the amendments to that claim. I am being pretty cautious about amendments because I don't want to give the government any defenses to our federal lawsuits. So if your client, you know, I understand, I am viewing, I think we all at Beasley Allen are viewing this claims process as simply a statutory prerequisite to get to federal court. It's just too voluminous for JAG to be able to handle this. So. Um, I don't think we're going to go through the substantiation process, um, but I am going through the amendment process because I want my claim form to look just like the allegations that I make in my lawsuit because I don't want the um, government to be able to say, oh, you didn't say cancer in your original form, and so you waived that. Um, I don't know if, if that's a possibility, but I certainly don't want to risk it. So I, I would advise you to amend your claims and make sure that they are, um, list every illness that's applicable. So this is an internal document that um, we created just to kind of help our clients understand this complex process and tell them where we are right now. Um, so I, as, as I said, I'm talking about the claims process and then Leslie is going to talk about the federal litigation process. So I have a little bit of a zoom in on the claims process for the next slide. So um, this, this is a summary of what we've already talked about. Um, um, and we will be happy to provide you with all of these slides. Um, you, you can get them emailed to you. You will have a hard copy of this so you don't have to write all this down. And I know it's a lot of information and it might be small on your screen. I'm going to go from left to right. Um, so we start out with the intake information that we talked about, trust and verify. The verification, then get the signatures from the client, you know, um, submission. We are submitting ours by CSV. That is a bulk submission process that um, creates basically an Excel spreadsheet called the CSV that in the Department of the Navy has, um, you know, requirements of what goes on that CSV. You can submit original claims forms one at a time if you have less volume. Um, the Department of the Navy has said that they will go through the CSVs more quickly than filing a lot of individual claims at once. The next part going down the arrow is the perfection that we've talked about and then determination. So now what I'd like to do is talk about what the Department of the Navy has sent out to all attorneys about what how they view the process. Now, Jennifer Langley is an attorney with JAG and she's kind of taken the lead on this claims process. And she sent us, all of us, um, an email that has this 
she attached two charts and she has an email. And I will tell you as a little side note that for some reason they have my email incorrect in the system. Um, it doesn't have a dot between my first and second name. Um, and I've tried to correct it about 10 times and they've told me, do not send any more emails. <laughs> so I get my emails from a friend who forwards them to me, if you can imagine. Um, so, you know, I understand they're very, very overwhelmed um, and they're doing their best, but um, they are way behind. So um, again, this is a very, um, it's a small document. Um, but I wanted to show it to you and go through it with you. And you'll have hopefully a hard copy that you can look at later if you want to. But I'm going to start up at the left and just bear with me and kind of go through each row. So the very top, as I said, this is a document created by JAG. Pre-perfection. Um, email uh, or mail. And as I said, um, you can submit it by CD-ROM or single paper claims. CSV batches is what we're doing. And that is what Jennifer has said that she prefers prefers and that go more quickly. They import the data, they review the data and review it. Um, and that's, I believe, where we are in the process right now. <laughs> that's, you know, that's the stopping point. Now, this is the aspirational part that we want, all want. So you want to get, um, the next part is to get that perfection letter, get a claim number assigned, um, they do a mail merge, and then they mail them out. I will tell you that we are not waiting for um, perfection letters or claim numbers in order to file a federal lawsuit. I don't think it's necessary. There's nothing on the face of the act that says it. As long as you have proof that you submitted your claim and it's been more than six months, that is sufficient. The next line here is claim management um, on the right side. So they have been talking about building a document management library that does not exist yet. And um, you know, the government has a lot of security measures it has to implement in order to have this document management system. They can't just receive documents by Dropbox. That's not the way the government works. They have to, you know, have a lot of different um, security measures. Um, so it is, it is going to take a while. Um, amendments, withdrawal substitutions, as I talked about. Now, this is when I said I was going to follow up on don't just be the last person to submit your claim. So Jennifer sent us this email and um, I have it here in front of me. And there are a couple of things that were major um, eye openers for me. And one of them is the dual rep issue. So if you read, um, it's kind of tiny, so I'm gonna read it to you here. Uh, and it's in the second row and it, yep, right there. So multiple firms fighting over the same client and putting us in the middle like divorcing parents. So I will tell you, um, Jennifer has a sense of humor. It offends some people. I, you know, we all have to deal with stress in different ways. This is her. Um, you know, I, I happen to think she's funny, but some people think it's offensive. But anyway, this is who she is. So what she said in her email that I find concerning, and I'm going to read it to you. I have it here, is what if two or more attorneys have filed a claim for a single claimant? Firstly, some of these situations are making us relive our personal trauma of having to choose where to live when mom and dad got divorced. Please work it out. <laughs> okay. So um, that's something that is important. Work it out with, um, with the other attorney who is representing your client, because this is the Navy's solution. Ultimately, we will just have to end up taking the last signed attorney authorization. It's like a will. Hiring of another attorney is the implied firing of the other. Don't make me be the bad guy. So um, that's one of the reasons why I said being the first to file is not necessarily the best way to go here. But as I said, also, the deadline for filing claims is not until August 10th, 2024. So figure out if your client is represented by another attorney and work with that attorney and do figure out your dual rep issues. Because if you just file it, you could be in big trouble. Um, she also has said that only one claim can be filed. So what if my client is a pro se client? And I'm going to the next section here. She says, well, this is awkward, but I cannot really tell you about the other claim because you aren't the attorney on that claim. Plus, to make it really bad, if their claim gets denied, it's bad news for your claim because claimants only get one claim per person. 
denial of one claim is denial of all claims. So communicate with your client about the importance of not filing a claim by yourself. And um, if they have, you need to do a substitution. If there is multiple, if there are multiple attorneys on this, you need to withdraw one with client signature. That's why all of these, these terms are so important because, you know, you can't file more than one claim for more than one, for one person. So I'm going to go down to the next row here. Uh, we're talking about adjudication. Um, again, this is this is farther than along than where we are. Um, Parker denials are something that we as um, lawyers do not need to worry about. That is the Department of the Navy's alleged problem. Um, they say that they have to issue Parker denials once a cl claim proceeds to litigation. I'm not worried about that. That's their problem. Um, and then, um, you know, we've got, they are going to go through the investigation. Now, I really wanted to draw your attention to this next box, derivative claim linking. So this, to me, means that they are considering derivative claims. That would be a loss of consortium claim. That would be a claim where someone was not on base for 30 days or more. So that is where the Department of the Navy's head is right now. What does that mean for settlement purposes? I don't know, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, you know, now we've got su substantiation, which hasn't happened yet, um, negotiation, settlement. I will tell you at this point, as of last week, approximately 93,000 claims have been submitted and zero claims have been paid. So um, that's where we are. Um, so we are not at settlement or payment. Um, but remember, again, this is why you need your proper client's name and the proper representatives for when it does get paid. Um, then there's uh, denials, reconsideration, and litigation. Um, the claimant services are on the next um, on the next line. I think those are pretty self-explanatory, administrative. We've got policy decisions, and I just wanted to draw your attention to something that I didn't initially see when I read this. It's in tiny print, and it says crying sessions. So, you know, Jennifer is really she's really working hard, and um, they are working on hiring many more people. In this email, um, she said that they are nearly doubling their staff. Um, she has asked everyone to please be polite and nice. She's getting a lot of really angry emails, which is not fair. And um, she also said, please email the CLJA inbox instead of her personally, because she's getting over 400 emails a day and she just can't keep up with that. Okay, next. Um, I only have about a minute left to talk about this, but I just wanted to show you this other email that um, came from Jennifer, uh, this other attachment that came with the email, which is their um, process for substantiation. Um, I think it's really fascinating because, we, again, we've got these three different columns, personal injury, wrongful death, derivative claims. Okay, so they have an entire section for derivative claims. I just, you know, okay. And I also think it's interesting that they're looking at um, they're looking at medical records and expert opinions at this level. So, um, as I said, to, to summarize Beasley Allen's position on the administrative claims process, we are not right now going to comply with the the, um, the aspirational substantiation process. We are looking at the administrative claims process as a statutory prerequisite to file suit, and that's a perfect pass off to my colleague, Leslie, who's going to talk to us about the um, loss, filing of the lawsuits. Great. Hi, everyone. I am going to talk about step two, which is the actual litigation process. Um, as Julia mentioned a couple minutes ago, approximately 93,000 administrative claims have been filed. But I want to tell you, as of this morning, only 1,086 cases have been filed in the Eastern District of North Carolina. So this is part of the progression uh, internal document that we created because the Department of the Navy has six months to make a decision regarding the claim. And as we've talked about, and I kind of want to breeze through it, one, two, and three of this slide have not happened yet. But number four has. So six months have passed and 1, 000, at least 1,086 of these claims 
and no action was taken by the Navy. So once six months has passed, the claim is deemed denied. So now your claimant's case is ripe for filing. It does not mean you have to file right now, but it is now ripe for filing, okay? So with regards to filing, I know maybe some of you, uh, the six months have passed and you're like, what do we do next? Well, the Eastern District of North Carolina's website is a fantastic resource, okay? And I'm gonna go through everything that's currently on its website, but um, there are clickable links to everything that I'm gonna talk about for you to um, you know, go through and walk you through the filing process and understand what's actually happening in the Eastern District of North Carolina right now. The very first clickable link is the actual text of the PACT Act. We always talk about the CLJA, but the PACT Act stands for the Promise to Address Comprehensive Toxic Acts of 2022. The CLJA is section 804 of the actual PACT Act. And it states that if a plaintiff, this is important, if a plaintiff does not reside in the Eastern District of North Carolina, you must file your federal lawsuit in the Southern Division, okay? And this is pursuant to the CLJA and also pursuant to Local Rule 40.1. So if they do not reside in the Eastern District of North Carolina, you file in the Southern Division, which is in Wilmington, okay? Otherwise, there are four other divisions. I'm gonna talk about them shortly, but there's the Western, the Northern, the Eastern, and the Southern. So case filing instructions um, are also there. Um, it'll give you all the tips on how to file and, and what to do. Um, there is a standing order of service that is clickable on the website. This addresses the services of the service of complaints that are currently filed. Uh, there is a link to the very first court order, which was the April 24th, 2023 order, which addressed four main issues. And you can read about them. It was the creation of the master docket, submissions for leadership, the goal, the court's goal to create an ESI protocol and how to handle Pro Hoc Vitae admission procedures. And so after that was entered, um, there was another order entered regarding the motion for admission to be Pro hoc into the Eastern District. There is a form there for the motion for admission plus the affidavit that you as a lawyer need to sign and the fees. It is page two, if you wanna reference it, page two of the April 24th, 2023 order. And it used to be that if you were going to file cases in the Eastern District of North Carolina and you were not a member of the North Carolina Bar, you were limited to being pro hoc into only three cases. The judges took care of this and you can now file a pro hoc vice motion in each case. And it's $100 per lawyer for each case. You still need to have a North Carolina admitted, barred, local council, whatever. You have to have someone from North Carolina file that motion for you, okay? They will be filing it electronically. So you still have to have a North Carolina sponsored lawyer in order to file your motions for Pro Hoc Vice admission. And the most recent order that is on the court's website that you can reference is the July 19th order, which is now officially case management order number one. And what this does is it appointed leadership and created um, an executive committee and eight subcommittees. The leadership that was created is seen here. This is part of the order. Ed Bell, as we all know, the, the, the godfather of, of the Camp Lejeune Justice Act is the lead counsel. Co-lead counsel is Zena Bash for Keller Postman. And she's also the government liaison. And you can see here all the other attorneys who have been appointed by the judges as co-lead counsel and liaison counsel. Liaison counsel, Warden Smith is a local North Carolina law firm, if you didn't already know that. Let me talk to you a little bit about the executive committee that the court created. Um, so there will be appointees to the executive committee and there are eight subcommittees. There's a criteria bellwether committee, um, a government liaison committee, database development committee, resolution committee, science experts committee, administrative common benefit, law and briefing and discovery ESI committee. So those are all of the committees that were created under this order by the court. 
and the judges, uh, the four judges, um, I talked to you about the different divisions. So Chief Judge Myers is in the Southern Division and, and, and Wilmington, and he was appointed by Trump in 2021. Fun fact about uh, Chief Judge Myers is that he was born and raised in Jamaica. And then when he came to the United, the United States, um, he didn't go to law school until I think 1998, but from 1991 to 1995, he was the lead reporter for the Star News covering the murder case of uh, Mike, uh, Michael Jordan's dad, James Jordan, if, if y'all remember that murder case. So he was the lead reporter for the Star News. And now he's presiding over Camp Lejeune cases. So pretty interesting. Um, Judge Boyle, he presides over the Northern Division of the EDNC. Uh, he was appointed um, by Reagan, and he has been a presiding judge here in the Northern Division since 1984. Uh, Justice Flanagan presides over the Eastern Division. Um, she is a George W. Bush appointee, and she has been presiding since 2003. And Judge Dever, so let's get the pronunciation right. Re remember, it rhymes with never, so Judge Dever, not Judge Dever. Um, Judge Dever is also a George Bush, George W. Bush appointee and has been on the bench since 2005. Um, topic issues. Um, well, VA benefits, I'm sure you are aware, uh, and probably you've been pinged by your clients over the last over the last week or so, two weeks or so, that they've received correspondence from their congressperson regarding uh, applying for benefits under the PACT Act. Um, there was an August 14th deadline. It was originally August 8th. It was then extended until August 14th to apply for VA benefits under the PACT Act. Um, I don't know what everyone else is doing, but Beasley Allen is only handling the personal injury or wrongful death claims under the Camp Lejeune Justice Act. So we did not advise clients with regards to applying for VA benefits under the PACT Act. We simply instructed them, you might still be getting calls, but instructed them to call the number or click on the link that they were provided in the correspondence from their congressperson. Um, Next up is the current status of the filing of the cases in federal court. As I said, over only over a thousand cases have currently been filed there. Um, leadership right now is working through um, whether or not there's gonna be a short form complaint or a master complaint, but it is uh, at the top of the list to handle along with the states. Um, the judges recently signed an order for discovery deadlines and pleadings deadline, pleading deadlines Right now, defendants' answers are not due until September 1st. So it started back in July and it keeps getting extended. So the current deadline for the government to file an answer in these cases right now is September 1st. So we've not seen one answer in any of these cases so far. The estate issue, obviously that's the million dollar question as Julia talked about. Um, the court is very aware of this. Um, leadership is aware of it. It's on the radar and it will be one of the first things that is tackled as, as we move through. Um, associating North Carolina Council, um, we talked about if you are not licensed in North Carolina and admitted and sworn into the Eastern District of North Carolina, you've got to get North Carolina Council, okay? We at Beasley Allen, when we started this litigation, we had three lawyers uh, admitted into the North Carolina and then admitted into the North Car uh, Eastern District of North Carolina, Julia Merritt being one of them. So if you have not associated with North Carolina Council, I suggest you do so. Um, another hot topic is CBS. Upon the one-year expiration or the, the one-year mark of the passage of the Camp Lejeune Justice Act, they came out with an article right that day saying basically like, you know, it's been one year since the passage of the act, veterans and their families are wondering where the money is, right? So I just wanted to include that if you have not seen that article. Popular resources that we use, um, some things that are helpful. Again, this will be uh, in, the, in the, the slides that we do give you, but I wanna bring your attention to the ordering of the military records, getting the DD-214s. What we're doing is if you file your administrative claim, that should trigger right away. Let's get that DD-214 to prove that they were at Camp Lejeune. Um, I'll tell you, 
sometimes the DD-214s can be a little bit hard to read, but we've found out and we've met with leadership and we've discovered certain things that if the DD-214, you know, indicates that they were in the main side barracks or and they were the second Marine Division, they were predominantly at had not Point, okay? Um, there are a lot of other resources that we are now able to um, check out to see if our our claimants, whether they be a civilian or they were sponsored there or if they were um, a vet, um, there were family housing records, um, there were phone book records. Um, the Globe was a newspaper that was at Camp Lejeune from 1945 to 1990. So there could be photos of, of your client that might've been printed in the Globe at some point in time. Um, there is a Marine Corps muster rolls that is um, kept uh, in archives archives.gov. So these are other resources that you can use to prove that your claimant was actually at Camp Lejeune for a certain period of time. So I know we wanted to reserve at least 10 minutes for questions. And so I think I've done that because it's now 1250 Eastern. So um, if we don't get to your question, if David doesn't get to your question today as the moderator, our email addresses are here and we're very happy to um, answer any questions you have that we can't get to right now. All right, well, on behalf of all our viewers, I wanna thank Julia and Leslie for bringing us a very helpful and a very thorough presentation. We have received a number of questions during your talk and if you guys will allow me, I'd like to present them to you and get your feedback. So our first question comes from Caroline who asks, do you read the February 10, 2025 deadline to apply to everyone, even if their administrative claim was denied outright or effectively much earlier than the August 10, 2024 deadline? Sure. <clears throat> I can answer that one. Yes. Um, we're, if you look at the text of the act, it says, um, you know, the date six months after the date of submission or the claim of the claim or the end, uh, the final deadline of submission of the claim, whichever is later. So six months after that, I, I didn't say that very artfully, but if you read the statute, we feel comfortable that the deadline for all claims to all lawsuits to be submitted to the federal court is February 10th, 2025, regardless of the date that you submitted your claim. All right, thanks, Julia. Our next question comes from Robert, who asks, is there a viable claim for wrongful death and survival action if the person dies after August 10, 2022? Yes, the answer, the short answer is, is yes. As long as their injury occurred as a result of the contaminated water before August 10th of 2022. If there was a diagnosis and then it is a cause of death or a contributing cause of death listed on their death certificate. So short answer is yes. All right, our next question comes from John. John asks a two-part question. First, is there any overlap, objection or disqualification if a veteran has an existing recognized Agent Orange exposure claim or designation by the VA? And second, is there a causation defense that could arise under these circumstances concerning Agent Orange that negates the Lejeune causation nexus? You want me to handle it, Julia? Or me either. It's fine, go ahead. Well, I think the answer, the, the short answer for this one is we don't know yet. Um, but the reality is we are filing claims <clears throat> and filing lawsuits on behalf of people who have had Agent Orange exposure. And I believe that, you know, we're not going to be able to uh, litigate all of these claims in federal court. There's just no possible way. So eventually, hopefully, there's going to be some sort of a settlement matrix. And um, probably Agent Orange exposure is going to be some sort of a uh, reductor. Um, so, I mean, this is all kind of, uh, speculation, but I don't think, I, I certainly wouldn't preclude filing a claim on behalf of someone who had Agent Orange exposure. Suffice it to say, though, at this stage, there, there have been no settlement offers and there's, there's certainly no settlement matrix that's, that's been presented, correct? Absolutely not. Not even one claim has been, has been settled. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next question comes from Nick. He asked, at what point are you sending amendments for a claim? For instance, 
Are you waiting for a perfection determination or will you amend prior to receiving that perfection letter with the Department of Navy claim number? We're amending on a rolling basis and um, and we're not waiting for a perfection letter because as Julia mentioned, we have filed over 2000 administrative claims and we've received back 22 perfection letters. And y'all, there's been 93,000 administrative claims already filed. The backlog is just, it's wild. So just it, amend on a rolling basis as you see fit. And obviously before you file your federal lawsuit. And I just want to add one little thing to that. Um, you don't need the perfection number. Um, you can use, you should be putting your unique client identifier when you submit your claim. So that's, you know, at Beasley Allen, that's our client matter ID. Um, and so just put that, the date that you filed the claim, the changes, and that will be, um, you know, that will allow them to connect the dots back to the original claim that you filed. Okay. Our next question comes from Terry. It's a client specific question, but, but here goes. She asks, if a child is born on base and lived there more than 30 days, but suffers no medical issues at the time or at this time, the JAG office said that the child could file under other, but what would be the circumstances that would allow that? Does that make I'm sense? Not I'm not sure if I truly understand that question. So they right. actually, they have no qualifying injuries or other otherwise any injuries. Okay. If that's the case, if there are no qualifying injuries to me, that would be considered like a medical monitoring case, which we are not, um, we are not accepting those because, you know, like we said, the injury has to have accrued by the um, August 10th deadline. I, I'm not saying that JAG wouldn't accept that claim, but you know, I don't know what um, injuries that you would be able to allege. All right. Well, it, on a similar vein, um, Edward asks, what are we doing if we can't find proof of residency and exposure, but the client insists they were there? Or are you relying on affidavits in those cases? And th that might be the, the last resort. Go ahead and get an affidavit, names of any witnesses that could attest that he was actually there, whether the witness is dead or alive. Um, again, there's been other resources that have been recently brought to our attention, like the phone book and the public. There is a housing registry with 90,000 names in that housing registry. So there will be a way at some point in time, I promise. But go ahead and get an affidavit from that claimant at this time. Yeah. Wendy asks, um, we filed over 400 claims, but we're still not getting emails from Langley. How can we get them to put us on the list, sir, that they are sending these emails out to? Unfortunately, I, I feel your pain on that one. Um, I also am not on the list. Um, so, you know, the only thing you can do is uh, do the registration um, and then hope that you get on it. Or um, if you want me to forward you things that someone else forwards to me, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Jennifer asks, in your estates, are you requiring a publisher's notice to creditors or a published notice to creditors? We haven't gotten there yet, to be honest. And we're okay. going to let the, the probate attorney, you know, advise us with that, uh, either a North Carolina probate attorney or a probate attorney in the state or the county in which the, the estate will be probated. Okay. Next, Sharon asks, if a client receives VA benefits for Camp Lejeune related illnesses or death, how will those be affected by settlement offers and suits in this situation? Yeah, this is a great question. It's a question that affects a lot of our clients. Um, you know, the short answer for this one is that their VA benefits should not be affected. Um, but when settlement comes, there will be some sort of set off. So, you know, you're not going to be able to collect, double collect for the same injury in two different methods, but that might be a um, some sort of a set off at, after settlement. Okay. Kyle asked the question with a neurological injury, would you advise going ahead and investing in a causation expert opinion? 
I would wait. Oh, go ahead, Leslie. That's okay. I, 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 I agree with Julia. I would wait. But we have uh, a consulting epi and a consulting toxicologist that we've run by a lot of injuries for and neurological diseases have been part of, you know, um, you know, they have found uh, science to support some neurological diseases, but I would, I would wait, but I think we are going to find some supportive evidence. Okay, we're running short on time, but I want to try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, Andy asked the question, if a spouse or wife refuses to assert the claim for the husband's death, can his adult child pursue that claim? Hmm. Andy, why are you trying to stump us? <laughs> yeah, it's one o'clock. Time's up. <laughs> so, so the spouse or wife does not want to bring a claim, but the son does. So I, I'm assuming if if the if there was no will, then obviously laws of intestate would apply. I'm I'm not really certain how to answer that question. Yeah, we'd have to talk to a probate attorney and see what depends on what state they lived in and, you know, who this, yeah, the laws of intestacy, whether they had a will. I think it just is depends on the specific state. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Julia and Leslie, we have so many more questions that we weren't able to get to. So uh, if it's okay with you guys, I'd like to encourage those people who have questions that weren't presented, weren't answered, to call you guys at 800-898-2034 after today's program. Is that okay? Or email. Email is probably best. We'll be able to respond right away as opposed Perfect. to calling email. That's right. Send in an email uh, and we'll try to get right back to you. Let me go over some final housekeeping notes before we break for the day. For those of you who may have missed our earlier announcement, by the end of this week, you're going to receive an email with a certificate of attendance and an updated presentation and video link. That'll include all of the slides you've seen here today. You can email that completed evaluation form to webinars at BeasleyAllen.com. Again, for those Alabama and Georgia attorneys participating by phone, it's imperative that you send us uh, your name, phone number, and state bar ID number. You'll email that to webinars at BeasleyAllen.com. That'll help us ensure you receive full CLE credits. Uh, for those of you practicing in other states besides Alabama and Georgia, we're going to send you a certificate of attendance that you can present to your own state bar. Last but not least, be sure to check out the events page of our website as we're going to be adding more webinars throughout the coming year. Once again, thanks for joining us today. And thanks so much for supporting our Beasley Island webinar series. Have a great day. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.